Imperva protects applications wherever they live and at the pace of development. From securing applications at runtime to protecting APIs in any cloud environment, only Imperva offers a unified solution across edge, application, and data to help you achieve more and save money. Start a free trial today and quickly protect your web applications at securityweekly.com forward slash Imperva. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Nikhil Gupta about the pain points that security teams still deal with and how they're building communities to improve those practices. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with John Kinsella, and it's just about time for the news. First, some announcements, of course. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and completing the form. We review those suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Plus, you can join us June 29th for a webcast with Tyler Robinson and Bull Bullock to learn how to pivot into the world of crypto security. Visit securityweekly.com slash webcast to register with only your name and email. And plus, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings that we've already done over here at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. Mr. Kinsella, it's episode 199. We need to be as informational as possible for our response codes. And uh, it's a Friday, and it's a busy news Friday, in fact. This is this is a good thing. I've got um, a big DBIR report that I think we'll maybe save for the end because there's a lot of interesting vulns that lead to things like incidents and breaches that uh, we should probably talk about first. You've got a couple that... Um, uh, highlighted for you, which which ones? Which one was your favorite one to kick us off with this week? Ooh, I get to pick. Um, let's see. Where do I want to go first? Um, you know, I really like this uh, DNS backdoor. So not quite a vulnerability, but sort of is. Um, Sai Saitama uh, backdoor uh, uh, malwarebytes did a little bit of digging on it, and um, you know, so to. Give a little bit of background on this. Most of these malwares, they 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 want to go talk to, to mom and dad, right, and get their instructions. You know, commonly referred to as a C two server command and control. Um, but the tricky part becomes how do you go and talk to your C two without the rest of the world noticing, right? You know, it's um, I'm sure some of our listeners have like these these big um, uh, blue teams which are sitting around like watching all their network monitoring systems. Like, okay, do we see like, is there like new files in the system or do we see like someone talking in a strange port in a network? So what these guys said to do was um, tunnel their requests bi-directional over DNS, right? DNS seems fairly innocent and, and you know, we're just going to let that happen. So um, yeah, that's what they're, they're doing. And this goes through sort of talking through what they're doing in detail. But in a nutshell, what they've done is they've figured out that, um, okay, do we, do we want to go through a, a quick tutorial of DNS for people? No, it's like an interview question. But um, in a really tight nutshell, uh, you know, um, there's one DNS server out there. Well, basically, there's root servers for say .com, and then like, you know, you have like, a, I don't know, let's say securityweekly.com. And, and when you go looking for that, then there's two or three servers out there that are the author authoritative servers for that, for that domain. Um, so th these are how the DNS request gets routed through. If you go looking for www.securityweekly.com to sign up for our show uh, notes and our, uh, you know, our, our everything we're doing, which is great out there. Um, but what they decided to do here in this case is that front part of that. So we talked about .com, Security Weekly, and then the dub dub dub. So what they're doing is that www is they're putting a value in there which has meaning. Right. So it looks like a standard generic DNS request is going out. But when uh, that end server, which they're controlling, that authorita authoritative server, um, it takes that host name request on there and parses it out and is able to understand things like, hey, this is we've got a newly compromised machine. Um, I need to know what to do with it. And then as part of the response, which they're also encoding going back, it says, hey, here's a command for you to run or um, I need this file or I need to compress this file. Or so they've got this fairly, um, you know, still a basic language of commands in there, but they've got this language of commands, which we're able to send back and forth. Um, and I, I don't know, that sort of tickles me. It's, it's, I think some of you out there know, um, oh man, go, I forget his name. Uh, the dude who's always ripped, well, he's, well, anyway, it's just someone on Twitter who um, refers to uh, Route 53 as a, a database, right? It's, excuse me, Route 53, yes, <laughs> Amazon's DNS server yes, as a yes. database. And this is sort of, you know, not quite that, but it's interesting to see what happens with something as simple as a, um, a name lookup can be used to be sending information back and forth. So that really tickled me. Corey Quinn is who I'm thinking of. 
Yes. And um, so as bonus points, uh, John, now you need to walk us through uh, how DNSSEC works. So we'll uh, <laughs> free to finish that. No. Um, DNSSEC uh, yeah, doesn't it's, have it's to great... work because almost nobody uses it. So that's what's <laughs> wonderful about it. Now, now. <laughs> Don't be too informational. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, great, great call. And of course, this also, you know, speaking of DNS and this type of um, tunneling always goes back to you know the work that Dan Kaminsky did a lot too. tunneling yeah. pretty much every protocol on, out, out there over DNS. Um, I think he even did DNS over DNS and possibly ICMP over DNS. But there was just some, some fun playing around with that. But um, also some more recent things as well. We were just talking the last segment about Log4j. It came up one or two times in case you noticed. But um, one of the big aspects of Log4j was seeing the DNS exfiltration vector. So it's another, I think, you know, to tie that concept into the article you brought up here too, you know, hopefully those blue teams are have a way to monitor DNS queries, especially outbound requests, whether they're part of a, you know, C2 like this, or though there go some of your base 64 encoded or base 32 encoded uh, environment variables yeah. that log4j was picking on. So um, I think some some good le- some good broad lessons here to to learn as well to to generalize this, which I always and, love from these articles. Yeah, and actually we can go a little further on this one. Um, there's a pattern I've been seeing over the last oh I might have talked about before. I don't remember last few months, but definitely going back a little further. Um, it's particular with Go, but I'm actually seeing it in, in other in other applications now, which aren't Go-based, in that they don't use the system DNS resolver. Mm-hmm. Um, so they could be using either directly using, I've seen recently someone using Cloudflare's DNS resolver, or you know sometimes I think it's actually being done by some of the advertising companies purposely to not use the system DNS resolver, um, or tracking companies, right now, excuse me, customer analytics. Um, but the, the side effect of that is is for if you're trying to do either egress filtering or, or watch what's going on outbound in your network, all you're seeing is first a, a random DNS request go somewhere and then an IP address request go somewhere else. And it's pretty hard to track what's actually going on. Um, so that that's you know that that's good and bad, right? Depending on how you look at it, uh, it's 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 something I'm aware, I'm personally aware of. Um, I don't have a good solution to it yet, but I don't know. Maybe some of our listeners can write in and let us know how to how they're handling that. Yeah, that would be great to know because we talk a lot about like having blocking egress traffic, but mm-hmm. um, that tends to hit those TCP layer, if you will, all of the you know the the web connections, SSH, blah blah blah. But you can't forget about that DNS traffic as well and how to to potentially proxy that or at least be watching it. You mentioned too, uh, I'm going to segue now because you mentioned like Go, some other uh, tooling that might use their own internal DNS uh, resolution mechanisms rather than the system resolution. And those, that type of, I'll, I'll call it disparity or maybe surprise or mismatch between uh, how is something being resolved, how is something being parsed is where I'm going with here, is always interesting because that can lead into some problems, security problems. And here is a a Zoom article and how they were using XMPP, specifically XML, and parsing inconsistencies. And so this was a favorite topic of mine that stood out, how the uh, two different libraries were handling essentially, uh, uh, I lost lost my train of thought there, sorry, Uh, handling a UTF-8, handling internationalized characters. And essentially, it's the idea of generic, generally speaking, where do you do character substitution? Where do you do character failures? And this was just some really neat work out of Project Zero, just demonstrating some fun ways and some surprising ways that XML can be misused, abused, and uh, to get into some good uh, flaws that they discovered in Zoom. Plus, I guess one more thing I loved is uh, they called it stanza smuggling. So we've got a new a new fun phrase that's going to show up in some uh, OWASP presentations, I'm sure. So let's see, March 24th, three days ago. Is this, yeah, it is. So this is XMPP was being used, yeah, it's chat protocol. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yeah. I saw the patch for it come out. I hadn't looked too much into the the other side, but um, yeah, interesting. It's it's fun to see okay, that, that that's the pause of John trying to leave the snark out. Uh, it, it's fun to see how something, again, you know, a lot of these vulnerabilities, and I'm not sure it's how, how, how Mike and I filter these. Um, I don't think it is, but like 
we tend to find a lot of vulnerabilities which are really interesting that something fairly basic or what you would think of as basic, right? Chat um, or DNS um, and how malicious people are starting to use those in um, uh, unexpected manners, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of that core of, of the application security world. Uh, um, and, you know, if, if I was to get on a soapbox, I'd start talking about, do we really need a lot more and more and more uh, security application, application security tools out there when the problems we're seeing are still fairly basic, but I'm not going to get on that soapbox today. Uh, but if I was to, uh, so it, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, they respond to this one quickly. It's patched, it's patched hopefully for most of our, our listeners already, but um, yeah, it's sort of fun one. It is. And um, I, I'm going to just dangling some 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 red meat in front of you john not trying to make you bite but we'll see what happens but you know one of the reasons i also like picking out these types of flaws these types of vulns is they are often about like parsing they're about this they're about order of operations they're about things that are not so simple as just this is a compiler error that somebody should have paid attention to or here is a simple quote unquote input validation they forgot to filter something out which i agree um we don't need uh, you know tools aren't necessarily even going to help us in these cases these are people finding this this might be fuzzers so i'll squeeze that in there um that, that can help us identify these types of flaws perhaps but um, they're the more interesting ones that we still need humans to identify and reason through, I think, more successfully than uh, we're going to get out of tools. Um, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward in time here a few minutes. I, I'll admit I haven't read the DPIR yet. Um, but the reason I'm sort of click, quickly clicking through it is I'd love to see a stat. And I think they might have had this before. So we'll have to see if it's in here. Um, you can tell me. Uh, I'd love to see a stat around... The difficulty of finding a vulnerability sort of versus the difficulty of the tools which we have to protect, if that makes sense, right? In other words, like sort of what you're just saying, you know, it's, it's um, uh, you've got a vulnerability that's based on lack of input validation or filtering, something like that, which a human can sort of go, oh, what if I put, if I, what if I order 10,000 Cokes, uh, cans of Coke? Um, whereas yeah, the, right. the, the most things are going to be like, it's a very sort of human concept, right? That we're trying to get across these computer things. Um, but how you protect against that is um, relatively difficult. So it'd be interesting to see some sort of statistic about, you know, the, the good guys versus bad guys on, on who has the easier job here. Yeah, and I think uh, we'll, we'll 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 dip into the the DBIR for a second about that. There's still some more fun, fun vulns. I think from my initial read of it right now is that pretty much stolen credentials and social engineering, you know, legitimate access through uh, unauthorized uh, ob obtainment, as I'm making up words of credentials. Sorry, brain's not working right now. Is uh, is still like the best backdoor, the best entryway into an application, whether it is. The org is as compromised, or even as they they have a whole section on basic web attacks. If you can, you know, if you don't have MFA, if you don't ideally have like a FIDO2 setup, a web auth N, those are the the areas that are really resistant to any type of uh, social engineering, phishing, interception of um, even some types of MFA setups. Those are going to be your biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. And this other part in terms of talking about tools, I will just mention there's still a big theme about vulnerable known vulnerabilities, often in dependencies. So there mm -hmm. is, it seems, a big case just for SEA, just for app inventory, asset inventory, fix those vulns. And then they get into a little bit of the not quite a long tail, but definitely a, a lower percentage of the basics, just SQL injection. Some things that are that um, you know we rarely talk about here because uh, they are so dead simple and kind of boring, mm -hmm. but they still exist. So I'm always struggling to figure out how much should we still talk about that versus get into some of the more interesting questions about how w what does the investment take to find this that you're trying to bring up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm giggling. I just found a what page? This can't be twelve. Page um, thirty one. They've got a, so me and startup land, like one of the things we're, you know, startups always think about is like that sales funnel. How do we get customers in? What's that look like? And they've actually got a, uh, um, a threat actor op opportunistic sales funnel. So it starts off with the scanner and then the crawler. And it's, it's someone's um, been reading whoever came up with that. That's a great diagram. Um, 
Yeah, I want to back up a page or two here. You're just talking through, yeah, some of the basic things, um, you know, use of stolen credentials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, talk about red meat. Uh, it's, yeah, I go, I'll, I'm not going to get through all this right now. Um, this is like one of my favorite things to read, and this like this, this week has been horrible, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it you know it's it's I, I we've 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 killed that horse, I think. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's there, there's there's you know we will get excited on here when we find a very and we've got an interesting one coming up actually vulnerability when we find a very sort of more complex or interesting vulnerability that that's actually t required. I'll say technical excellence, but a lot of these things we cover are, are um, you know, could be, and I, you know, sort of, I, I'd love to bring it back to the last um, half hour and say, we can catch them through automation. I think a lot of them we can, but then a lot of them also are just like, you know, you need the human to go, you can't do it like that. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you balance that? I think it's the interesting thing. It is. And um we will move off DBIR. We want to just throw in the quick meta commentary on it. It's uh, as you were saying, you enjoy reading through it. I highly recommend that mm -hmm. people do. I just skimmed or I just, you know, did a quick summary of uh, one or two highlights really, but it's a great representation of how to communicate topics, both in the text, the write up really well written, as well as the charts, the visualizations. And uh, John, you've said before mm -hmm. how much the any visualizations appeal to you. These are great. And I yeah. think they're also great because there's no pie chart, there's no donut chart. And I think uh, anybody out there who is still managing all of your applications and volumes with uh, spreadsheets, like we were talking about in the last segment, uh, please move off of spreadsheets when possible, but find something more creative and clever than, than pie charts. They um, have all kinds of problems just with how they are poor at demonstrating area. There's a lot of better ways to, to do that. And the DBI, DBIR, is a great example of what those better ways are. But let's go talk about some more vulnerabilities. There's Pwn to Own that has a bunch, and let's maybe talk about one or two before we get into the, the big modern vulns. You mentioned looking at patches or patches um, for this. I pulled out the a critical Argo CD vulnerability, which honestly, normally I would have ignored um, because it's not necessarily something that everybody's using. Um, it did have a jaw to JWT in there, which is one of those usual suspects about any time you see a JWT, it tends to be suspicious. But the short, you know, the short summary here is that Argo CD, if you um, enabled anonymous access to the system, then a nicely created JOT, nicely configured JOT could basically get in and be an admin user or anybody else. What stood out to me were two things. One is that at least for once, this was not enabled by default, or this was that was not insecure by default. So that's just kind of that idea that it's nice to have defaults that are secure as long as those defaults are still useful to the engineers and every engineer and every developer out there can't just say, oh, well, this is the default you gave me, but now I have to go through my checklist to undo all of these default things. But, and I'm trying to do this all in a single breath, uh, the, it also had a link to, I went in, as I sometimes do, to look at the commit for this that, that patched it. And the commit for this was um, two different, it's written in Go, so again, go great language, but it's not immune to vulnerabilities uh, just because no. it's memory safe. Uh, it's not human safe, unfortunately. Uh, but the, the vulnerability was fixed in two different files in you know maybe two dozen lines of code. But then I was reading, you know, scrolling through the, the, the PR trying to figure out why am I still scrolling and scrolling and scrolling? It's because they threw a lot of test cases in here. And so it's literally almost 400 lines of, of test cases for this scenario. Now, some of it may be boilerplate and so on, but I just thought that was a really good sign that says this is an example of how to take security seriously in the sense that, yes, there is a vulnerability. We're going to fix it, but we're not just going to kind of do the perfunctory code commit and walk away. This is a really good example of how to prevent it, ideally, from happening again or, or things like this from happening. So kudos to them for that. That, that stood out for me. <laughs> Sorry, you got me looking at the command. Um, <laughs> I, knew I could snipe you on that one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Read some go. I don't know. I'm not here to comment um, on that. Uh, the, yeah, that's really interesting. So it's, when, when I saw you mentioned Argo in the um, show notes, I'm like, oh no, not again. 
um, I was helping them get through their security stuff with um, uh, CNCF. Um, I know they're going through a review. Uh, the guy who put this PR in is is quite good. Um, I mean, it, it's they've had a they've had a tough year. They've I think this is, might be the third vulnerability now, um, and it's not for lack of trying. It's like you know they've they've got. They've got their programs in place. They're doing the right stuff. They've gone through penetrate or not. They've gone through commercial code reviews, um, but I think it's just big enough, and there's enough people looking at it that, um, and it's doing enough complex things with Kubernetes uh, that it's 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 a large footprint. Um, I mean, yeah, you look at like a, a test like this that you know, I, I would. If someone sent me a PR like that on my code base, I would have the same reaction you. Like, what are you doing? And then I see the test yeah. and be like, "Oh my god, you're insane!" Um, it's super well done. Uh, can you keep the, the question? Then comes is like, can you keep up that level? Like, if we looked at the rest of the codes, do you have? Is this a one time thing that he's trying to do this one thing right, or they maybe they've said, "Hey, for a security fix, you need to really test heavily." Or when do you when do you put that much testing in, man? I mean. That's a, where's the actual fix again? It's like one, two. Yeah, there's a, there, yeah, there's a context so small, check man. right it's like at the it's, top. Yeah. It's really one line. Um, so you're looking at a, a 400 to one ratio completely. You, you can't, that doesn't scale. Um, I know there's more stuff further on down. Okay. It's not just the one file, but yeah, even if it's 10 to one. It, yeah. Um, I, I love it, but like to think back, like just purely as like we've talked about, you know, the cost of, mm-hmm. of unit tests and stuff like that before. This is excellent, um, but there's two things that are going to happen there. One, it's the, the actual effort to write that code um, and get yourself in that train of thought, but also there's the amount of time this is now going to take on your unit tests every time. And this is this is um, don't get me wrong, this would be considered. There's probably people throwing stuff at their screen or their 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 headphones right now because I'm not the manager saying. Um, don't write unit tests because it's going to slow down CI because <laughs> right. that's like an absolute crap response, right? Um, I get that. But at the same time, yeah, if, if you're um, – there, there is a balance there of like if, if I'm going to run the test locally before I push a PR or if I push a PR and then those tests are going to get run, um, h- how long do I expect my devs to wait each time just because tests are running? And we have talked about that before, but um, just interesting things to think about around that um, particular thing and um, – but yeah, it's it's yeah, and it it's yeah, yeah it, it it falls in that category. I was glad that's what you're glomming onto because we talked to two weeks ago about the the open source security foundation, their investments into um, the, you know, their very specific monetary investments, both on code security, mm-hmm. code reviews, pen testing, etc., as well as hiring engineers. And we were thinking about you know, we were looking at what did they budget just to fix or to create, you know, to re- do some refactors of two or three. Um, like a DNS uh, tool and t- a few other tools. And here's an example too, just touching on, if we talk about budgets and investments, sure, we got bug bounties, we got tools, et cetera, but there's still time that needs to take to fix these. And how do we figure out how to either proactively think about the budget for this or figure out how to spend at what points do we, um, you know, it just, just to understand what the security implications are here. So that is how I wanted to tie it to a broader picture as well as, Talk about the the the, the cost of vulnerabilities because we've got a big bug bounty one coming up. But mm-hmm. in, t- in the spirit of people making money off vulnerabilities, pwn to own, um, a mm-hmm. perennial competition. There's a lot of stuff that came out of it this year. Some printers, uh, for I think for the second year in a row, made it onto the list of some areas to make money. And uh, John, you're sh- I see you shaking your head already. So uh, we got to pull something out of you. Let's see if we could uh, trip John's snarkometer for, for in, in some way. Um, uh, the, the printers, I'm not thinking specifically this. I'm thinking back to, well, it's, is it in this one? Um, yeah, no, good. I can search for word spool and that doesn't show up here. Um, print spoolers seem to be having a year mm-hmm. again, um, particularly when it comes to Windows, uh, which is what the, the head shake was. Um, yeah, it it's, I think, so the interesting thing about this to me is beside just the the volume of, of uh, things which were found, was the ease with which they were found. Like day one, people were just like off to a running start. Like all the big names got 
got uh, um, shown a special form of hello, so to speak. Uh, and it kept going on through the days. So um, I, I, I don't know. Um, one of my things over the last few months is certain companies um, that are focusing efforts on uh, functionality versus fixing existing issues in their products mm. um, who happen to be spending heavily on talking about security. Uh, but it, it's sort of, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's how do you, how do you balance that? Whether that company or anyone else, right? Like, you know um, another issue here on Tesla, I think we were talking about them. Yeah, actually it wasn't even last week. It was this week on Monday. We were talking about the, the Bluetooth low energy stuff with uh, Tesla's. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a good mix of stuff here, but I, I, you know, the, the, the snark is sort of, um, um, nothing particularly special. I just thought it was an interesting collection overall of, of what had been found through the, through the week or through a few days, not even a week. Yeah. And I think, um, the, the Bluetooth, we, we did talk about that. I can't remember if I mentioned at the time, if I did, I'm, I'm going to end up repeating myself a little bit, but that was interesting just that the, you know, the, the, the. BLE was set up for protocols that wasn't intended to handle, you know, sensitive authentication, sensitive types no. of workflows. And yet here's an example of how it was implemented to do so. And then Pwn to Own comes along and demons get some money for it. And so even on the the printer side of things, uh, I think it was Synactive was they 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 posted a great blog post just talking about how they went through a lot of the firmware. So any of our hardware firmware folks out there who love that type of thing, do go check out the printer. Uh, write-ups. Uh, it's a good way to make $20,000. But um, John, $20,000, this is amateur That's hour. Nothing. Sorry, we're, we're in Come the wrong now. business. We need to, um, mm -hmm. I think Tyler and, and, and team are doing that uh, crypto security webcast at the end of June. Mm -hmm. We got to go listen because there's $10 million to be made out there on a single bug bounty. I just... I, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I, we don't even need to trade crypto. We just need to like pack the fucking thing. And, you know, it's like, part of my French, but um, yeah, we'll just make our money that way. Um, it doesn't matter if the market goes up or down. We're still getting our our, our uh, rewards. Um, yeah, this this was a, an interesting one, and I can see why it's a large um, to talk about it front. I can see why it's a large amount of money. So a vulnerability was found um, in uh, let's get our names right uh, um, in a bridge, which uh, allows uh, facilitates the ability to transfer between, I think it was Ethereum uh, and a few other uh, coins. Um, and I don't see in the article I'm looking at. But the, and anyways, between the ability to sort of uh, transfer back and forth between different coins, right? It would do the um, uh, the, uh, the the translation of what that what the um, exchange rate is and things like that. Um, long story short, was there was a unlish, uninitialized um, a vulnerability as a result of not being at rotten. <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> there was a vulnerability as a result of not initializing um, the structure which was being used uh, and the code which was being used. And as a result of that, uh, as you were actually explaining before, before we went on air, Mike, that would allow whoever actually came along first and did that initialization to uh, um, own, own what was going on there. So you can imagine the code which was actually... Um, handling that bridging is going to see a large amount of money go through it. And, and the quote I'm looking at here um, is uh, $736 million worth of assets were residing in the contract at the time that this uh, um, vulnerability was submitted. So um, yeah, it, 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 you know, everyone should be quite happy that they submitted this, right. And not decided to have a little bit of fun on their side because we, we've got enough of that going on. But um, yeah, I think you mentioned it's, it's basically a one line fix. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it a little more. Yeah, and this one, um, as you said, this is definitely not the first vuln that's come between these bridges between two different chains. And uh, clearly, it's a, it's a rich area, um, so to speak, for finding vulnerabilities as well as the potential consequences of those vulns. And yes, as I was looking at the Argo CD patch, because that had a really interesting, you know, fix to test, you know, lines of fixed lines of test code mm -hmm. ratio in it. And I said, kudos to the team for doing that work. I looked at this and I 
I had to figure out, did I miss something? Because literally the, the, the article here links to the transaction that fixes the issue and to protect what 700 million or so assets on their chain, it was a one line fix to call initialize. And, and that to me is just mind boggling. It's a, it's a nice parallel to see a, you know, a, a 10 letter function that is worth $10 million to fix, but it's also the type of thing that is, you know, we talked to, to um, trail a bit. So I'll go Dan Guido, their team is looking a lot of insolidity, a lot of the smart contracts, you know, there are security organizations out there doing this review. There are linters, there are security tools to look at these aspects, but just missing an initialization looks like the basics of basics and wow, the consequences here. So I think that's the best I can add to this topic. Um, not sure if I triggered any other ideas to think about, or there's, um, I'm sure there's something else in the news that we could find here. Yeah, really briefly, it'd be interesting to go back. Um, I'll try to do it after this, maybe, maybe make a comment on Discord um, after, the, after this recording. It'd be interesting to go back and look at the profile of the researchers who found this, right? Because this is a type of thing which, you know, as you were describing it out there, um, Banks every day have been doing this type of thing for for years, and like they know that something that's you have to get this right, right? There can't have any mistakes around this. So this is probably in a a large financial institution, one of the more carefully reviewed bits of, of their <laughs> software, right? Um, so it'd be interesting to see if the person who found this has a banking background, um, or they just just some random security researcher, um, and they they happen to I don't want to say get lucky, but you know. It, someone's having a good weekend right now. I'm telling you, it, it's it's um, even if you're a company, the bonus you go get off that 10 mil that that's um, that that's that's got to put a smile on someone's face. Yes, and uh, ho hopefully they get hard cash out of it rather than just some coins. That's yes. that's, all, that's all I'll add. Um, there's a, another small article talking a little bit about maybe attacker motivation or type of attacker we, that we brought up here. And you mentioned too the DBIR does talk about threat actors. It's not something mm -hmm. that I usually honestly care about because I care about more about the not not so much the motivation but the means and opportunity when we're looking at vulnerabilities we're looking at flaws because uh, it doesn't matter if it's an APT organized crime ring or some teenagers in uh, the United Kingdom if your organization is compromised through a social engineering and you were missing some you know MFA on some you know important systems that is the problem to fix. A real brief article I pulled up here, a little bit in that vein, that's similar to the um, red team testing uh, that in, in the supply chain area that we touched on either last episode or maybe two episodes ago. Another researcher here was going through and basically looking for old packages that had been dusty that the owners had uh, abandoned and, could, and the owners who had emails that pointed to now dead domains. So in one case, researcher came in along, found a domain that was long gone, spent $5 to register it, got the email uh, working to set up to do a password reset, could own the package now, and then do things like change the code and exfiltrate AWS environment variables. So there was, on the one hand, some good aspects here of just sort of reinforcing what we already know. Yes, their supply chain has issues. Here's one good example of how to um, demonstrate that, but maybe going a little bit too far in the sense of exfiltrating or having some apparently malicious types of capabilities in it. Now, I wouldn't yes. say that if you if you were using one of these, these packages, you probably should have just been rotating passwords anyway, rotating environment variables. So that's not necessarily a terrible thing but in the spirit of the, call it the, the ethical research coordinated type of research and demonstrating these vulns, you don't necessarily need to pull out those AWS keys just to prove once again, there's problems here in the supply chain. So just highlighting that is sort of, a, maybe that's our, our think piece for the week. Yeah, and what's, um, so th this article you pulled out um, from Sophos is, is given it a, a, a perfectly, um, uh, um, you know, unbiased view of, of what what's there. Um, as I saw this one go through the news during the week, there was headlines of like hackers steal AWS keys through blah blah blah. And it's like it's a suggestion that one way it could be used. It's not actually what yes people are doing. There, I believe my understanding is they were gathering all environment variables. Actually, this code shows that particular. That's interesting. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, the the version of what I saw was that the vulnerability was grabbing all ends and sending them somewhere. So maybe there's different versions of this running around. Um, 
but anyways, we've got our uh, um, wonderful production person, Sam, telling us to hurry up so she can go to our next meeting. Um, let's see here. I wanted to touch really briefly. Let's see. We've got two stories left. Any, meeny, miny, mo. Let's go with uh, Pants Down because that sounds fun. Um, this was a vulnerability that's been out for three years. In um, So Quanta, really quickly, is a company that um, they basically make what I refer to as white labeled server, sort of generic server. So versus, you know, usually we'd go or somebody might go buy a system from what Dell or IBM or HP or one of the big sort of the names, right? Um, a few of these companies cropped up about 10, 15 years ago. Um, I believe they're all Chinese or Taiwanese that are just, you know, build a server. We know it's in an x86 server now. We don't need to do too much craziness with it. Throw a BIOS on it. Um, you know, a few things. Here's your power supply and, you know, Ethernet and go do your crunchy crunchy. Um, so Quanta has been selling these bad boys to usually larger data centers. Um, but maybe one of you guys has these at home. I don't know. Um, but the, the BMC on there, the baseboard management controller, which allows you to, um, you know, sort of manage the server from, a, um, a, the phrase used to be, I think it's zero on site, but like manage the server remotely. Uh, it turns out, uh, if you've got a Unix prompt or a prompt on that system, their demo shows Unix, but I imagine it happens with windows too. Uh, basically, if you have access to the system, you're able to write to the memory of the BMC controller. Um, and what that ends up meaning is you're able to replace that firmware, do what you want. So you can overwrite the password, which is in there, and then have full control over the machine. Um, and, and generally, not really a great thing. So the CVSS came out as 9.8, almost a perfect 10. Sorry, we didn't get a perfect 10 this time. But um, I thought that was sort of interesting write up. Um, basic, easy, you know, probably not super easy, but. Um, uh, it's got a lot of people, one more reason to go and patch their system. So there you go. <laughs> there we go. No, 10 out of 10 for uh, taking us out on that one, John. Thank you very much. Uh, go patch your systems. I think that's something we could easily repeat every single <laughs> week. But I want to say thank you to everybody listening. Thanks once again to John for joining us. And uh, please subscribe. Give us a like. Check out the show notes. And speaking of crunchy, crunchy, that sounds like some good uh, grunge guitar. So maybe go listen to some Nirvana. Or speaking of 10, maybe Pearl Jam 10, their first album. And with that, we'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly.